Many of you have seen the film Imitation Game, which shows how Alan Turing broke the Enigma code. Some would cry out that three Polish mathematicians broke the code. Others relied that there were other geniuses working on the cipher with Turing and that there were 6,000 people working at Bletchley Park. So, what was the Enigma machine? And who did what in breaking the cipher? Now, there's a distinction between ciphers and codes, which tends to get blurred. A code replaces a word by another word or a number. A cipher replaces each letter by another. One of the oldest ciphers was the Caesar cipher, so-called because Julius Caesar used it for messages. It was a monoalphabetic cipher. If you write the alphabet and then place the alphabet below it, but displaced by four letters, like this, this is a message, becomes this. Now it's pretty simple to crack this once you know that the Caesar cipher exists. A practically unbreakable code was used by the Germans in World War I. It was the 13040 code. It used a code book with thousands of words corresponding to numbers. The encoder would look up the word in the book and write down the number and then look up the next word. The numbers had to be non-consecutive or that would ease the decryption. To decode the message, one had to have another code book with numbers in order with the corresponding word. This was cumbersome and if the enemy got hold of the code books, it would be difficult to change and distribute all the new code books. In 1919, a Dutch inventor, Hubert Koch, designed and patented a cipher machine using rotors, but never made one. In 1918, Arthur Scherbius had also painted it a rotor machine and made them. He tried to sell them to the German Navy, but they weren't interested. The company was restructured a few times, and in 1923, the first commercial machines were sold. Three new versions of the Enigma machine were developed. The Navy and the Army started using the Enigma Type D. The machine used a polyalphabetic substitution. It had a keyboard, just like a typewriter, and behind that was an array of letters that would light up. There were three rotors with 26 notches on, either marked with letters or numbered 1 to 26. On the right of the rotor were 26 spring contacts and on the left 26 flat contacts. The contacts on the right were connected by internal wiring to a different contact on the left. Each rotor was made in a similar fashion but the internal wiring was different. To the right of the rotors was a circle of 26 contacts connected to the keys and 26 contacts connected to the lamps. To the left of the rotors was a, what was called the reflector board, 26 contacts touching the contacts of the third rotor. Inside the reflector board, each contact was connected to another contact. Tapping on a key would light up a letter, but not the same letter. The circuit would lead to the first rotor and enter it as a letter which depended on how the rotors were set up. You might tap on an A, the wire representing A might connect to the contact for P on the first rotor, then come out as an X, and then go into the second rotor, and so on to come out the third rotor, into the reflector board. Then the circuit comes all the way back through the rotors, and might connect to the wire for the lamp G. G would be written down for the code. So you've got a setup where you type a letter, and another letter lights up, and that letter depends on the settings of the machine. A cipher like that would be broken in a short time by a cryptanalyst. Enigma had a trick. In our hypothetical setup, we typed A and G lit up. If we tap on A again, it would be a different letter which would light up. That's because each time we type a letter, the first rotor turns one notch. The keys are connected to a lever system that operates three pulls behind the rotors and each rotor has a ratchet on it. The first rotor ratchet is accessible to the pull and turns each time a letter is tapped. There's a ring on the first rotor 
that stops the pawl activating the second ratchet until a notch is arrived at and the second rotor turns a notch. Now every time the first rotor has done a complete turn, the second rotor turns one notch. When the second rotor has made a complete turn, a third rotor turns a notch. The basic Enigma machine had 26 to the power 3 times 60 combinations. That's over 105,000. Now 100 analysts could try various combinations and soon break the code. To increase the strength of the cipher, they added two more rotors to choose from. The operator might be instructed to put in 5, 2 and 3. Now the German security boffins tested the machine and came to the conclusion that it wasn't 100% crackproof. They added the pièce de résistance, the plug board. The plug board had a socket for each letter of the alphabet. Each typewriter key was wired to the corresponding socket on the plug board, and then to the rotors. The operator had 10 cables with plugs on each end. He could connect letters to other letters. If A was connected to T, Typing A would send T to the rotors and typing T would send A to the rotors. If a letter had no plug in it, the letter would be itself. The number of combinations was now 158 quintillion. That's 158 followed by 18 zeros. The cipher was now really uncrackable, but Turing and the Bletchley team cracked it anyway. The poles came into the picture in 1929, the Poles were proficient at decoding Russian deciphers, which dated from World War I. In 1929, Jerzy Rozyshki attended a cryptology course in Warsaw. He then worked in a cipher bureau with Marian Rodzewski and Henry Zygalski. From 1924, the Germans started sending messages that were unbreakable. Britain, France and the Poles approached these as a linguistic problem. It was the Poles who realised it needed a mathematical solution. With the help of a German traitor, they got hold of the code books for this machine called Enigma. Rzewski reconstructed Enigma machine. Rzewski and Zygalski worked on deciphering the code. Enigma machines were available for sale for commercial use but the Germans had made changes for security reasons. But the Poles could have a standard one to see how the machine worked. The German encoder would send a series of three letters twice at the beginning of the message. UNS, UNS might be enciphered as GSTKYX. The operator receiving the message would test his setup with these first six letters. They must come out as three letters repeated. This practice was eventually banned. For the deciphers, knowing this practice, it reduced the number of combinations drastically. Knowing that the first six letters should decipher as three letters repeated helped the poles to work out the wiring of the first rotor. Rzewski made a small machine called the Bomber, which helped determine the first rotor's wiring they were soon deciphering over 75% of the messages. The military Enigma machine at that time had just three rotors. That meant six possible combinations for placing them in the machine. The bomber had six spindles on top and each would have one of the six possibilities of the combinations. The bomber could test all configurations of the rotors. The Germans realised that sending the three repeated letters was a risk and stopped that. They also added two more rotors to choose from. There were now 60 combinations to place the rotors. The bomber would have needed 60 spindles. The Germans also started changing the Enigma settings every month and then every day. The Poles were aware that Germany was going to invade so they made the decision to get their work out of Poland and share it with the French and the British. It was by building on the work of the Poles that Turing was finally able to crack the codes every day. The Enigma machine had two weak points. One was that it was used by humans 
and the other was that a letter typed was never ciphered as itself. Every morning, a German weather forecast would be broadcast in cipher. Not surprisingly, it would have the word for weather forecast, Wetterbericht, near the beginning. Knowing that no letter can be ciphered as itself, you can write that word on a piece of paper and slide it along under the cipher text. In the first position, I corresponds to I, so that's not right. Moving along one place, we have an E with an E, and then an R with an R. But one more place, and nothing corresponds. So that cipher text could represent Wetterbericht. Other words that can be known is the person sending the message, and of course the signing off lording of the Führer. These words were known as cribs. From a sequence like this, the cryptanalyst would make a menu indicating possible settings for the rotors. All this gives a great start to finding the day's settings. The first plug board settings would be guessed. Say we start with an A linked to a T. Further settings would be deduced, but then perhaps we come to a G being linked to an A. That means all the plug board settings are no good. Most people would say we've got to start from scratch. Alan Turing said, all the connections made following the first assumption are wrong, so they don't have to be checked again. The Polish bomber had represented an Enigma machine set up with the six possibilities of rotor settings. Alan Turing developed the first Bletchley Park bomb in 1939. Gordon Welchman improved it in 1940 by adding a diagonal board to replicate the plug board. Many variations of the bomb were made. They were seven foot tall by over six foot wide and two foot thick. In these banks of 108 rotors, each vertical group of three was working as an Enigma machine. In an Enigma machine, the rotors had 26 contacts on each side. The circuit would flow one way and they come back. The rotors on the bomb had four concentric circles of 26 contacts representing in and out in both directions. The top rotor represented the right-hand rotor of the Enigma. It would turn at 50 RPM. One revolution represented a German operator typing a letter and his colleague writing down that lamp letter 26 times. Later bombs turned at 120 RPM with the design flaw, the operator laxism and the genius deduction of the cryptoanalysts, the bomb could narrow down the number of settings for the day in 20 minutes. The last step had to be carried out by cryptanalysts. They could then spend the rest of the day deciphering German messages. The Kriegsmarine were even more security conscious than the Wehrmacht. In 1941 they developed an Enigma machine with four rotors chosen from eight for submarines. This was a new challenge to overcome. The Navy machine had 368 combinations for the rotors. Now these machines were made with a thinner reflector board so they could be compatible with the three rotor system. Bletchley Park got a lead on these. A submarine broadcast a message with the machine set up as three rotors then reset the machine to four rotor system and resent the message. Comparing the two messages gave an insight into the workings. The real break came when they snatched the Kriegsmarine Enigma. This showed them that the machine could work as a three rotor Enigma and that the fourth rotor never turned. It would take the bomb over an hour to find the Navy settings compared to 20 minutes for the Army machine. You might wonder how, if the rotors are changing each time a letter is pressed, the receiving machine can decipher the ciphertext into plain text. If you have two machines side by side, set up in the same way, say one is the coding machine and one is the decoding machine, we type an A on the coding machine and a G lights up. That means that the rotor setting key A and lamp G are connected as are key G and lamp A. 
We tap G on our decoding machine and the letter A lights up. The right hand rotor of each machine has now moved one notch. We type A again and now C lights up. On our decoding machine we type C and A lights up. Now Alan Turing was known to many even before the imitation game made him and the Enigma machine even more famous. Alan Turing wasn't the only genius at Bletchley Park and the Enigma machine wasn't the hardest cipher to break. Hitler himself used the Lorenz cipher machine to communicate with his high command. That used 12 rotors, even more impossible to break than Enigma. A terrible mistake helped the British start breaking it. In 1941, a message was sent from Athens to Vienna. The operator transmitted in clear text the exact settings of the machine, then sent a 4,000 character message. The receiving end said they didn't get the message. The sender reset the machine to the same settings and resent it. By comparing the two messages, it took John Tillman 10 days to decipher the message. Then another genius, Bill Tutt, now deduced how the Lorenz machine worked without ever having seen one. The first machine used to decipher the Lorenz messages was built by Max Newman and used two perforated tapes to compare the holes. It was called Robinson after Heath Robinson who made cartoons of improbable contraptions. With Robinson, the tapes tended to get out of sequence and the process was slow. Tommy Flowers was called on to solve the problem. He used just one tape and processed the information digitally. There were 2,500 valves or electronic tubes and the paper tape could be read at 5,000 characters a second. This machine was called Colossus and was the real forerunner to our modern day computers. As mentioned, Gordon Welchman improved the first bomb design of Turing. Now, the intelligence gained from Enigma was called Ultra. The information had to be managed carefully. If the Allies had reacted effectively to each bit of intelligence, the Germans would know that the code had been broken. They had to decide if they could have got the knowledge by other means. One effective method was to send a reconnaissance plane over the German troops. When the German move was countered effectively, they would assume the spotter plane had given them away. Ultra was also useful for telling the Allies that the Germans had fallen for their deception of fortitude. When Eisenhower was in the meeting with his commanders on whether to go on the 6th of June, a message was handed to him. It assured him that the Germans believed the invasion was going to be around the Calais area. The British and Americans were also breaking Italian and Japanese codes. The Germans developed a replacement for the Enigma called the SG-41. The British never broke that code, but the war finished before the Germans could use it. It's generally accepted that the work of Bletchley Park shortened the war by two years, thus saving hundreds of thousands of lives. The thousands of people working there were sworn to secrecy and it wasn't until the 1970s that it became public knowledge and many people from Bletchley never spoke of it. It was kept a secret for so long because although World War II had finished, the Cold War had started and they didn't want the Russians to know how good they were at breaking codes.